Today's episode of the Counseling Tutor Podcast is sponsored by Web Healer. You're a counselor in private practice and you need a website, or you've got an existing website which you need help with. Web Healer are offering Counseling Tutor Podcast listeners, that's you, £100 off the cost of a website design and build. Now, Web Healer specialise in websites for counsellors and psychotherapists. It's what they do. And the Web Healer team provide a completely non technical, done for you solution, leaving you to focus your time on your clients. Operating for 20 years, Web Healer are a trusted resource amongst counsellors when it comes to getting your practice online. So get the package details and claim your £100 off coupon for your new website by going to counsellingtutor.com forward slash website. That's counsellingtutor.com forward slash website. Welcome to the Counselling Tutor podcast. The must listen to podcast for counsellors, psychotherapists and counselling students. Here are your hosts, Rory Lees Oaks and Ken Kelly. Hi, I'm Rory and welcome to episode 282 of the Counselling Tutor podcast. Today we're thrilled to have a remarkable guest with us, Karen Moore. Karen has an impressive skill set and she's here to pull back the curtain so we can peek into a specific skill set facilitating critical incident debriefing groups. So stay to the end to hear her fascinating insight. And as always, I'm joined by Ken. Ken, how are you doing today? Yeah, great. I'm well. Thank you for asking, Rory. Uh, episode 282, as Rory has mentioned, and we've got three stops. Of course, you've already heard about the amazing uh, interview with Karen Moore. But we're going to start off with student services, where today we're going to be looking at choosing and using academic texts during the arc of your study. And I think this applies post-qualification as well. We often turn back to those texts and there's some great tips that we'll share with you today we then go into ethical sustainable i don't know what that was <laughs> ethical sustainable practice sounded like pineapple danish there ethical sustainable practice where we're going to be speaking about counseling from home it has some benefits could it have some drawbacks? Let's dig into that one. And then, of course, Practice Matters, the CPD section, where we're going to be hearing that amazing uh, interview with Karen Moore. Let's kick off, Rory. Student services, recognising that student journey. We have to turn to our textbooks. We get recommended reading lists. But, wow, there's a lot of reading there. I'm looking at my daughter. She's at uni. And quite honestly, I'm going to be honest with you, if she had to read all of the recommended reading books for her course from cover to cover, it would take more time than she has actually within university, Rory. Acad using, choosing and using academic texts. Have got any tips for us? Well, strangely enough, Ken, yes, I have. <laughs> so, um, so, so straight off the bat, the reason I've chosen this uh, topic is because um, it's come up time and time again in our Facebook group. And uh, I'm sure if you're a regular listener, you'll you'll know about our Facebook group. But if you just joined us, um, type counselling tutor into Facebook, you'll find us, and you too can see all the wonderful uh, conversations that go on. But yes. Time and reading, you're absolutely right. If if I read everything on the reading list for my course, I've still got my reading list for the course I did, I wouldn't have had any time to actually either attend classes or do anything else or even work for that matter because it was it was there was such big text. And one of the things I learned very quickly is that academic textbooks are different from the books you take on holiday. So if we go on holiday, you, you, you buy, you buy a, t a book and I'll start at the beginning and finish at the end and it'll be nice. It might take me the week and very good. With academic textbooks, you don't start at the beginning. You start at the back in the index. That's the first tip. So when you're being asked to ask, answer criteria or to write an assignment, um, the best thing to do is look at what you're being asked. So take a very, very, very simple um, question, define what empathy is. So what you're asking to do really is to give a view on what empathy is. So the key word here is empathy. So you're in the back of your textbook, you work your way down, 
um, in, in the index until he found empathy. And you read those chapters. You read those, those, those bits. That is what you're going to use to form the underpin of your assignment. You don't start at the front of the book in the hope that at some point you may stumble across empathy. What you're doing is you're going directly, you're putting, as they as they say, the meat on the bone, and you're looking at empathy. And that is the way you use academic textbooks. And if I look at my academic textbook, if I put the spine in my hand and, and hold it up, I'll notice that some of the pages are more um, open you know, the book opens to some pages more than others. And that is because I've had the I've been looking at specific things. I download my book now on Kindle and it's noticeable when I bookmark, I have a section of bookmarks on my on my Kindle Kindle reader with the areas that I'm looking at. Not the whole book, just the areas that I'm looking at. Now it might be in the fullness of time, I think, oh, I'll just read a couple of other chapters. There might be something useful in that. But really, the academic textbooks are a means to an end. They're the tools that allow you to answer the criteria, to gain the understanding, to answer the criteria, to be able to put your paper in, or to be able to um, put theory to practice. They're not holiday reading. And I think that's probably, for people who are just coming into study, probably that's the biggest learning, I think, yeah. I think that's a great re- learning, Rory, and I, I, I know that that doesn't necessarily apply to all. And I say that because I know you, Rory, like nothing, no, nothing more than to uh, devour an academic book, and I've seen you devour a few in their entirety, cover to cover. Uh, so it yeah. could be that it is your thing, uh, but it certainly is not for me. And and I like how you've distinguished between academic reference reading and what you might read in your spare time. And you can read counselling related books in your in your spare time. Mm. And you, you mentioned the, the Facebook group. Often there are sharings of books, things like counselling for toads, why the cage bird uh, sings, loves sings, exec- yeah. execution. Now, there's some books that are read because they, they nourish the counselling journey. However, it's an academic process when you're studying counselling. And within academia, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. We are building and learning about the work that is that 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 those before us before us have paved, um, and we want to be referencing what we're learning. So we're evidence. Yes, we understand this learning, but we want to be uh, referencing or paying homage to where the theory originated. Who was that? Where did they write about that? Was it a paper? Was it within a book? Um, So we're actually referencing back. So it is a reference process when you are using the textbooks. And I like how you said, Rory, you, you, you go to the back of the book, you go to the index, you go and look for the topic or the subject that you are studying. And I think back to my own assignments, my desk was absolutely full of of books everywhere was a little bit before the time of uh, internet availability of books, mm, or if mm. maybe they were around, but I, I certainly didn't have the skill set to use them. And uh, there was uh, little um, sticky notes in the pages that I knew and I would get and I would say, okay, this is theory. And I had within my textbooks marked out the theory pages and I would go, okay, this is I'm comparing to Gestalt. Now I'm going to grab the Gestalt book and go to the theory section. And I think that's another great tip is when you do have a textbook, there's nothing wrong with having a quick look over the textbook, understanding what kind of stuff is in there. So have a look at the, the table of content within the mm. book that is there to serve as kind of a memory jog. You might be sitting in a lesson, tutor, lecturing on something, and they say a word and you go, oh, hold on, where have I seen that before? Oh, that's in such such a book. That gives you the opportunity to go away from that lecture, go to such a such a book, go and find that using the table of contents or the index at the back and look at that topic in a little bit more depth. And I think that is a great use for an academic textbook because they can be pretty dry. They can be pretty uh, difficult to read. And I have to say, studying person-centered therapy uh, during my studies, I found some of Roger's work pretty difficult to read however i also have to say his later work specifically uh his his last book a A way of being that i read i actually loved that and i read it i found that i could read it from cover to cover and it felt like he'd he'd taken on a different style there so 
it's it's about where you find yourself. And I guess all of this comes second. First is find out what the reading list is. Mm. Find out what books you should have around you. And when you look to those books, they can be pretty expensive. So have a look around and see, are there other ways of getting hold of the books? You mentioned, Rory, Kindle as an example. And a lot mm. of the academic books are available in different formats, some more expensive than others. So there are cheaper ways of doing it. And there are some books that you can also pick up secondhand. However, Rory, tell us what we need to watch out for if we are saying, all right, I'm going to get a secondhand book. Well, yes, thanks, th thanks, thanks for that segue, Ken. <laughs> um, yeah, <clears throat> yes. So on on the whole, theory doesn't change. So if you're buying books written by Eric Byrne or Carl Rogers or Albert Ellis or whoever you're studying, Patricia Clarkson, their theory doesn't change. If they've written it, yeah, that's their theory. It doesn't matter if they wrote it 20 years ago or 10 years ago. That's the theory. And, and unless the theorist has rewritten parts of their book, which is, in my experience, kind of highly unlikely, um, then the, that that is the book. And I've got books that are 20 years, 20, 30 years old um, that I bought secondhand. You know, I, I would I would go into my local bookshop and, and buy, you know, a, a, what I call a handful of books, five or six books, just for reference, just for academic reference. Certainly when I was um lecturing you know just to just to get a wide a wide a view of the subjects i was studying but there are some books that we really need to buy up to date what are those books well any book on um uh, ethics you know there's there's different books there's a there's a standard and standards and ethics book which is very famous it's by tim bond standards and ethics in counseling by professor tim bond and that gets updated periodically. And I would really strongly advise you to buy the latest um, edition of that because ethical frameworks change. And if you're quoting ethical frameworks um, from a book and opinions from a book, then you need to make sure that they're quoting the up-to-date framework or professional framework. And I think the same goes for legislation. Legislation, we don't have a lot of legislation in counselling. But we do have some, you know, in terms of confidentiality, what we're, what, you know, where we're allowed to break confidentiality, and also legislation about um, 2010 legislation about counselling um, people who have been adopted. There's, there's some legislation there. So make sure that if it's a, a book on a legal opinion, there's quite a few books on legal opinion, make sure it's up to date because, again, things change. But generally speaking, you know, a, a look around the bookshop. If you're in, if you, here's a good tip. If you're in town, if you go to a new town, always go in to the Oxfam shop or the or the the charity shops that are around, and you can pick up some real bargains. Mm. You'd, you'd be amazed at the books I've picked up, um, and some of them are literally brand new. Um, and uh, you know, so if you if you find an area with a university, so here's another top tip: if you you know have a look at <laughs> there's a university, and if you visit in that area. Visit the the charity shops, and you know if you visit them, maybe kind of I don't know June July, you when the students have probably finished their studies and they may be getting rid of the books, you can find some storming belting books, storming and belting. That's a very northern <laughs> phrase, isn't it? Storming and belting, but very Mancunian that, okay. um, and you can get them at a fraction of the price. And of course, you know they, they sold on eBay, they sold on trading sites. So you don't have to spend a fortune, but they are expensive. Some of them are, are very expensive, Ken. They are. And uh, another place, if you're looking for used books, is counselling due to Facebook group. We often see somebody, you know, they've graduated and they pop their, their books on. We're not a bookshop, uh, but we do, from time to time, uh, let somebody post their books. So you might pick something up over there. And you mentioned the, the importance of that new versus the old editions when you're talking about legislation, when you're talking about ethics. And I think there's a, there's a view beyond that as well. And it's knowing what is going on outside of the text book, specifically if something has changed. So 
uh, the the uh, that there was an update of at least the the BACP ethical framework. Uh, was it 2018, Rory? Am mm-hmm. I remembering mm-hmm. that correctly? And perhaps, and 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 uh, word is out there that they may be looking to update that again. Why? Because things are changing. AI has just come in. You know, there's maybe new considerations. So if you're writing about ethics, go to an ethical body and download the latest ethical framework and make sure you're at least having a look over that and referencing it so you're not quoting out of date information even a book written a year ago might change and of course there was a massive change here in the UK when GDPR was uh, introduced it was a way of protecting storing and managing data and of course as counsellors as psychotherapists we 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 are managing uh, what is called specialist data because it may contain medical records somebody might tell us what medication they use or that they've been in a previous mental health service and that automatically makes the information fall into a specific category. Now, that was a a, a European law, the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, that came into effect. Um, And when the UK moved away, uh, the United Kingdom moved away from Europe, uh, it was called Brexit, should have been in the news (laughs) near you. I I didn't see it, (laughs) Ken. I saw nothing else for a number of years. Uh, there was uh, there was a, a further change where it moved from GDPR to UK GDPR. And as, although there are many similarities, there are also some differences there. So just being aware of what is happening legislatively uh, uh, or ethically with an ethical body, I think, is really really important. And I look back to two thousand uh, and and. 2021 when we went into the the, uh, covid there was the lockdown there was a big move to online telephone counseling Mm. and coming out of that there was a recognition that maybe online and telephone counseling needed its own framework or its own set of uh, um, kind of criteria that we can base training on and so things are changing all the time so it's always good when when you have your academic books just to look a little further than that and ask yourself the question is this still relevant today so if it's carl rogers 19 propositions is it still re- relevant today yeah because he hasn't done any updates i can promise you that <laughs> 19 propositions no. remains the 19 propositions but an ethic or a law or a uh, an expectation of how we might practice could change so just be aware that outside of the textbook there, there may be some additional information to look at there and then of course if we're speaking about academic books we can't leave the topic without speaking about referencing and again we hear so much about how referencing can trip one up. It can. You can have a, an assignment sent back and referred with the information correct, but references being incorrect. And referencing can be tricky. Uh, what might we do, Rory, to help us reference? Well, I think there's, um, first of all, I think any good training establishment would give exemplars out mm, yes. so that you, you can see how referencing is. It's, it's writing academically should should be taken as that that someone else will read out your assignment so so that's that's why that's why we asked to write academically so in the in the when when it's read out it it, it is it is kind of slightly more slightly slightly dispassionate slightly takes away from the you to to getting into this is what was said. This is the this is the information, and um, and within that you may have different views on that information. I've certainly, you know, he talks about empathy. There's there's certainly different opinions on on empathy and how empathy is used. And in fact, em- empathy we have idiosyncratic empathy. Um, we have now have double empathy when we work with those people in the neurodiverse or neurodivergent space. So. You know, so I think sometimes it, your books need to reference um, not just the classical ideas, but perhaps the, the the newer ideas. But when we when we're talking about actual referencing, gone are the days when you have to write long long references in your reference list. You can use a lot of tools. Um, I use uh, Bibli, which is a, a very very good tool. It's free online, and all you do is you just type in the book, and it produces the reference for you. No problem at all with that. Totally, totally correct. Saves lots of time. 
And I can guarantee you, your tutor will be eternally grateful when you use it because it means they don't have to go around and, and say, as I've said, and I know you've said it many occasions, Ken, actually the reference is incorrect. So the first thing, um, try and get an example of what the referencing looks like. Your organisation should be able to give you that. And secondly, save yourself some time and use an online referencing generator. And you just put the book in and click the button, go and get yourself a cup of tea, come back and it's developed not only the reference you can put in your reference section, but also the in-text referencing. So Rogers and then and then your brackets and then 1953 and then close your brackets will then um, come up as well. So you get your in-text references. So it's it's really, really important to, to have a, a kind of holistic approach to this. The right books, but also the right way of explaining and how you reference the text that you've read. Yeah, it, and it all starts with finding out what the referencing requirements are, as you <laughs> beautifully said there, Rory. You know, yeah. we, we started this by saying get the reading list, understand what the books are that you need to know, and understand how your references need to look. Is it, is it Havard referencing? Is it a, di a different kind of yeah. referencing? So that if you are looking up an online referencing generator or a tool, you're looking at the right one. You don't want to be going into Google and say on right, online reference generator – because you're kind of spinning a wheel of what kind of references it might be generating. And there are many. I looked mm. on the Manchester University website at referencing, and there are so many, there are many more ways of referencing than, yes. than I've had hot dinners, Rory. There really are. So using the right online referencing generator is correct. And if you put the right search term in, uh, and that can be found from your learning institution of what you're required, you're more likely to get a reference generator that's going to that's gonna match what you're doing. Generate a reference with a reference generator and then check it rory said get an exemplar does it look the same as the one that my tutor gave me and said here's an example does it look the same does it is it the same kind of format because it is important you're being asked to reference and you know at the end of the day academia is a big spider web one paper references and links to another paper it is the body of work that builds over time where the research is done where the where the work is put in and it references what has come before and then there might be some new work in that that is then peer evaluated and then you might be referencing that paper when you were doing your research and so it builds up this massive spider web of what has come before and all the references kind of point back to the origin all the way back if you follow one reference back to a previous paper that's going to have a reference to where they got information and where what they found so it offers a robustness it means that there has been a lot of eyes that peer, peer review process over the whole arc of the development of that theory and how we practice and what we practice uh, how we present ourselves so uh, that's I guess what the references are there for so when you see them in the books when you see them on the handouts that you might get from counselling tutor, because we always include the references of where uh, the information comes from, you now understand why uh, so many of our lectures in our uh, counselling study resource and in our CPD library, there's probably one or two slides at the end of each <laughs> lecture just on <laughs> references. And I used yeah. to look at references as, oh, that's the boring bit. I don't need to worry about that. They, they, it, it is the origin. It is where the information came from. It's actually quite quite interesting um so anything else on books rory before we kind of back um, out yes yeah well i i think that i think i'd, I'd like to go back to the the notion that, that of of there are some books that i are just nourishing to read i personally wouldn't read um client-centered therapy by carl rogers from cover to cover but I would read um, a way of being from cover to cover because Rogers, um, Rogers' writing had changed. The way of being is more what we call a polemic, which is a critique and a a pithy a pithy observation of the world. And I would I would really encourage anybody to read a way of a way of being. And I challenge you to not think it wasn't written last week. It's still up to date. 85 it was published, just before his death in 87. And there are lots of other books that we can draw from and quote from that we can read cover to cover. And we talk about Love's Executioner, uh, Counselling for Toads. You know, there's, there's, there's so many really lovely books. I know why uh, The Caged Bird Sings by, by Mayor Angelou. Wonderful, wonderful, rich um 
rich learning about diversity and difference. And and we, you know, in, you know on the road by Jack Kerouac, I, I've read that, you know, lots of really interesting books, which gives us, I think it gives us a added flavor mm. to what we're studying. I think, I think that the academic ingredients can sometimes not be very fulfilling. <laughs> and I think sometimes we need just to put a little, a little soup song of other things in our reading yeah. to, to bring it to life, to, to get that taste and that deep texture. Um, I'm on a food trip at the moment, I think, Ken. And, <laughs> and I think it's about being widely read. You know, I've always said that, you know, if you're widely read, you, you really can't go wrong because you not only have you got the, the, the kind of raw information, but you've also got the context that it sits in. And I think, you know, uh, I think that anybody who's interested in the world of counselling and psychotherapy I think I think that's essential. Yeah. So, as an avid reader, just don't just don't stop. Just keep just keep getting those books and keep reading them. Definitely. Well said, Rory. And I love how you you related it to the spice. Those additional books that nourish during your yes. journey, and feel free to drop little bits of that spice into your assignments. Feel free to reference those other books as well not just your reading list so yes you want to be re referencing your reading list you want to be showing that you're following the curriculum doing the reading that you should do but those those little extra books those those side books that you mentioned rory those nourishing books they do add spice and uh, not only to your own learning but they can add spice to your assignment work as well that you hand in uh there it is that is some tips on academic books we have a super duper handout that has been made up just for you which covers just the simplicity of what we've spoken about today. It's five big tips that uh, that are written for you on how to use academic books for your assignments. It's for students of counselling and psychotherapy. You can get it. It's free of charge. Just go to counsellingtutor.com. Click on the podcast tab. Go to episode 282. That's today's podcast right there on the page. Download it. Print it out. Have it beside you. Add it to your study file. And that brings us to the end of Student Services. Student Services is sponsored by Counselling Skills Academy. Have you ever wondered if you're using counselling skills effectively? Confidentiality means we rarely see skills used by others, so it's no wonder that so many students say they lack confidence in their counselling skills. That's why I built Counselling Skills Academy. Counseling Skills Academy is an online course that you can do at your own pace. It will give you the skills competence and confidence to know that you're using your skills most effectively. You will see real counseling skills used by a counselor in real life sessions covering everything from how risk is assessed right through to working towards an appropriate ending. Visit counselingskillsacademy.com to learn more and to claim your counselling tutor discount. That's counsellingskillsacademy.com. And as we kind of leave student services, we go into ESP. Is that mind reading? No, it's ethical, sustainable practice, he says, with a smile on his face. <laughs> and he, this is where we recognise those uh, counsellors who start a private practice or grow a private practice or... Uh, are involved or thinking of starting a private practice. So we try to look at uh, areas that might not be covered within the counselling formal study journey that are important to running a practice. And one of the considerations that comes up so often about starting a private practice is room hire. Do I go out and do I hire a room or do, if, if I have space in my home, could I run it from home? And I think it depends. And what you want to be doing is making a list of pros and cons. And that's what we're going to talk about today, the benefits and drawbacks of counselling from your own home. Yes, absolutely, Ken. And I think I think this is the ethical part of it for me. Mm. So in 2016, when I left my, my, my role as senior lecturer at a college teaching counselling, um, part of my move into self-employment was to set up my own private practice. And I have to say, uh, right at the get-go, this was before um, online and telephone counselling was mainstream. So it was it was there, but it wasn't as mainstream as it was. The pandemic changed everything. And as we know now, it's we live in a mixed economy of online and, and in the room therapy. So I, I decided that I, I decided it might be useful 
to counsel from home. So I thought, well, the best thing I can do here is, you know, think about it from the client's point of view and, you know, think about what are what are the what are the advantages and drawbacks from counseling from home? Well, the, the immediate advantage is cost. I wouldn't have to hire a room and convenience. I wouldn't have to drive anywhere. So those were the two initial, the two benefits. And then I started looking at the drawbacks, of which I found there were quite a few. Now, the first thing is I live in a wonderful area, wonderful part of the world called Mosley, uh, where the where the people are kind, um, thoughtful, and shall we say vigilant. They're very vigilant, the people who live in, in my streets. And it's not it's quite often that I might have someone say, Do you know there's someone knocking at your door the other day? And it, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And um, and and uh, 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 you know, I, I certainly have colleagues visit me. And I recently had a, a female colleague visit me, and someone said to my wife, "Do you know there was a woman going in your house?" Yeah. <laughs> it's like being in the 90s, but like being in the nineteen fifties, isn't it? And um, and so so I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful if there's anybody listening in my life mean, for their vigilance. But um, you know, I think that could be a difficulty. Um, the second was um, the fact that um, my house isn't easily accessible by um, a wheelchair, and being that it being counselling in towers has a very steep, you know, baroque staircase, um, it's quite could be quite difficult for someone to access the, the the bathroom, and you know, clients may want to use the bathroom. You can't say no, you can't. So I put that on my t- on my dr- drawback tick list. And then there was just the practical elements. My home is my home, and it's got pictures of my family, so I'd have to take those down. Um, and also, um, th- there was a strong objection from Mrs. Counselling Tutor, who um, who was very, shall we say, uh, vocal about people, and I quote, traipsing in and out of her house. So uh, as I share the house with my wife, and it's her house as much as mine, I decided that on the balance, probably working from home wasn't for me. But that was because of a specific set of circumstances. You know, the thing is, there's a lot of people who work from home and and it would depend on the, the circumstances. I know you for a time worked from home, mm. Ken. Yeah, very much so. Thank you, Rory. I did. And, and you know, looking back <clears throat> during my studies, um, my uh, supervisor, worked from home when i Mm. moved supervisors my second supervisor worked from home when i did my own personal counseling during my studies uh, the counselor that i chose worked from home and they were properly set up ideal settings for working from home so there are benefits you've mentioned them rory and cost is a great one Mm. comfort for yourself um you know there's not no no traveling to work (laughs) back from work if you if you're in your own home Uh, so the benefits i I guess do kind of speak for themselves um depending on how you've set up your accounts and how you've registered your business there is sometimes you are able to to claim a, a, a portion of money for the electricity that is burnt to to keep your room warm within your home you'd need to look at that with your with your accountant or bookkeeper because there is a a very fine balance there um but yes the drawbacks and i think the drawbacks are a you've you've said it rory and the word curtain twitches came to mind and i I never said that's about my neighbors i know no no well i'm definitely not thinking about your neighbors here rory he says (laughs) very defensively (laughs) Uh, uh, so curtain twitches is is kind of a slang word for for people that any noise they hear out out in the street or wherever it may be they 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 might be looking through their curtains and it it, it, it depends will the person be seen will there be confidentiality can that person arrive have their session and leave and feel that they're not being observed, watched, looked at during that process. Yeah, there is one consideration. Where might they 
park their car? Is it easy to park the car? Or are there times when all the the parking is gone、mm. and it's on street parking? They may have to walk for some distance. Have a think about that. What that looks like, and then think what what that looks like if the person has has a, a, a mobility impairment that makes it difficult for them to walk a long distance. Do you have access an accessible practice? Can somebody who does have a mobility challenge access your property and your facility? As you mentioned, Rory, the bathroom, and so often we can put off sole focus on the counselling room. So I've got a spare room in my house. It's going to be ideal. We're not using it. It is the counselling room. I go in there. I design it. I pick the wallpaper. I pick the clock that doesn't tick. The tissues are out. The great, nice, comfy chairs are there. I look. You can't see into this room, which is great. Everything is private. Everything is confidential. This is for me the perfect counselling room. I post the pictures with my peers and say, "Look at my counselling room. That's great." What is the journey to your counselling room like? Does the、mm. person need to walk past other parts of your house? How do they? How do they get in? So if they're walking. Up a flight of stairs with your family pictures、uh, over the walls. What is that saying to that person?、Uh, and 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 I guess that's not what we would have if we hired a a, a, a room.、Um, I know that there are other considerations that you might not think about, and this happened to me. I did counsel from home. I did have access. I did have parking. I had、uh, satisfied myself that、uh, the journey into the counselling room was was blank and and nondescript, and it was respectful for the clients.、Uh, the bathroom is accessible from my counselling room,、uh, but I was sat there one day with a client. We'd come to the end of our session, and suddenly somebody appeared at my window. Now I'm a floor up. You can't appear a floor one floor <laughs> up at the window. It was a window cleaner who had. Changed their day because there had been some bad weather, and suddenly the client was. I was looking at the client. The client was looking at the window, and I saw a strange look on the client's face that prompted me to look over my shoulder. And sure enough, there was a happy chap smiling and cleaning the window <laughs> and kind of waving to me. So it, it's those kind of considerations, things that we don't necessarily think about. What happens if a parcel arrives? If you're the only person in the home, if you're not the only person in the home, can somebody else overhear you? Can the client overhear that there's somebody else in the home as they're coming in? Can they hear a clatter in the kitchen? Do they then feel maybe somebody can overhear me, even if they can't? And then another consideration is, with if you are working from your own home, how do you work your waiting room policy? So if you、yeah. have one client and you're seeing a client. Straight、uh, thereafter, and your second client is early. What do they do? How does that work?、Um, and it can be managed, but it needs to be thought about. It needs to be taken to supervision, and you need to work out what the pros and cons are for you, relevant to your home and your practice, and and and、um, I guess make the decision from that, Rory. Yeah, abs- absolutely. And there's some other things that have, have kind of come into my awareness as you were speaking.、Um, on, on, if you're working from home, you, you, you are in fact lone working, and maybe we'll do a podcast on lone working at some point. But you're lone working now. I, I, I don't want to scare people, and generally speaking, you know, I've, I've worked with hundreds of clients, maybe thousands of clients, and I, I can count on the finger of one hand those who. May have had some difficulty with, say, anger, or may have attended under the influence of substances, or may have just been, shall we say, a little odd. You know, let's 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 be let's be real. You know, you're dealing with the full panoply of humanity, and I'm a male counsellor. I'm quite a big guy, so you know, the the fear for me is probably less. And I don't I don't you know I don't want to go down too far down this rabbit hole. Of you know, if I if I wasn't who I was, I may feel a bit more vulnerable. And I've had female colleagues, and I'm not saying all female colleagues feel the same as this by any stretch of the imagination, but I've felt just a little bit vulnerable about being you know on their own with maybe a male client. So that's that's the first thing to consider. And the lone working policy: how do you make sure that you're safe?、Mm. You know, and we'll, I think we'll cover that in another episode. And I did say at the, right at the start of this, right at the top of this this piece, that I don't work from home. That's not actually true. What happened was 
was when the pandemic came, um, of course, nobody could work in their practices. So the online and telephone counselling became mainstream. And I find myself today working from home. The difference is I have a dedicated room. I use I use my office here, um, which is sometimes referred to as the studio because that's why we recorded the podcast. And it's got a it's got a, a backdrop. It's 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 developed specifically um, for you know if I want to do some counselling, it's a respectful online space. But more to the point. All the family refer to it as my office. Even my little grand granddaughter, Izzy, says, oh, can I come in your office, granddad? And I go, yeah, come on in. And it's a space where I can leave and go back into the rest of the house and re-engage with the family. So if I'm, if I'm working with something which is really heavy duty, I can leave it in this space and go back into my life. And that's something that you really need to consider if you're working from home, I think, because... If you ha- if you have something that touches you personally, or is you know sometimes we work with really really tragic and sad presentations, and uh, you know the ability to decompress, the ability to be able to get in your car from your practice, drive home, you know get out of your car, just decompress, listen to the radio, just decompress. When you get home, you're back in your home. You don't get that luxury when you're working from home. There's no decompression. And I would strongly, strongly ask people, take it to supervision and think about if you are working from home and you're working in your house, how do you decompress when something touches you personally or or you've heard some really heavy material which you just can't shake off and it's in your home? Yeah. So important. It is. And and I love that you've brought in online and telephone working because the, you, you may then well be working within your home. And I think that we can definitely schedule another uh, ESP, Ethical Sustainable Practice, and speak about online and telephone working because there are some parameters, even if you are working from your own home, some considerations to take in, in mm. there. And it's things like, I don't know, have you got a dog? Have you got a dog? I've got three dogs. No. And if uh, if our postman comes to the door... Boy, do you hear about it? The dogs make a lot of noise. How might I manage that if I'm if, if I'm even online or even in a room with a client? What do I do? Oh, sorry, I've got dogs that are barking in the background. And maybe it's uh, just about thinking of that. And I wanted to leave with one final um, thought on this. And it's it's really interesting as I go into this final thought. Uh, we said the pros and cons of working from your own home, and uh, I, I just feel we've spent a lot of time on a lot of time cons. on the cons. And maybe that's because home working looks so uh, appealing. I guess. Yes. Uh, and and maybe you can work. There's many pros, and I worked from home for me, for many many years from my home for many many years very successfully. Um, but one of them is to consider if you work in a either online, so this wouldn't happen if you were working online, and it wouldn't happen if you were working in a hired room or a professional space uh, that was kind of paid for for, for counselling outside of your own property, then you wouldn't have a client knocking on your door at three o'clock in the morning if they were in massive distress. Because there's a consideration, and it is really unlikely, but Mm. these are the considerations that you would have to take into your contract and talk about to avoid that happening, you know, the no contact con- contact outside of hours. And I think there's been some films uh, that I've seen where the client arrives at the house and at an, in, at an inappropriate time because they're in distress. You know, what are, mm. what are we going to do? I'm going to go see my counsellor because they're just mm. two blocks away or whatever it is. Or what would happen if you get a knock at the door uh, in your time, in your home time, and it's perchance an abusive partner of one of yeah, your yeah. clients who's found out that that the going and seeing this person once a week, who are you and why are you seeing my partner? How do you answer that question? What so it I'm not saying that's gonna happen and it's it's really unlikely, but they, these are the considerations and going down the, the roads of what is it, hoping for the best, but planning for what you do yes. in the worst situations. And 
that's part of making that pros and cons list of where you're going to base your practice and what that's going to look like, what that's going to feel like. It defines your practice, I guess. That's ethical, sustainable practice. Get into the Facebook group, Facebook Counseling Tutor. Join in this discussion and share your thoughts, your feelings uh, on this topic. And we move out of our ethical, sustainable practice. We're going to Practice Matters, the CPD section of the Counseling Tutor podcast. This is where you claim those CPD points. And uh, we're talking about critical incident debriefing here, Rory, with uh, Karen Moore. You met up with Karen to discuss this really important topic. I did. And, you know, it It just goes to show there's, there's, there's so many opportunities once you're a qualified counsellor. And uh, as you'll hear, Karen talks about one opportunity she took up, which has been a, a very useful and very interesting um, set of work that she's undertaken through the years. So I spoke to Karen on critical incident debriefing, and this is what she had to say. Practice Matters is proudly sponsored by the Counsellor CPD Library. To access top quality, relevant continuing professional development for your practice that you can do at a time that suits you and all for less than the price of a cup of coffee, visit counsellingtutor.com. I think one of the beauties of having a counselling qualification is that it can open doors to work that may not have been in our awareness really interesting and rewarding work and uh, work that sometimes um, involves a, a lot of planning and thinking about so I'm delighted to welcome as my guest Karen Moore who is a former student colleague of mine now a fully qualified and, and, and gloriously well qualified uh, colleague Karen welcome so much for joining us Thanks, Rory. Yeah, happy to be here. So we're going to be talking about this interesting piece of work that you do, is critical incident debriefing. But before we do that, can you just tell us a little bit about your your kind of counselling journey from maybe when you decided to become a counsellor and what you've done in the years after you've qualified? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I decided um, after having therapy of my own that if I could help somebody the same way as I'd been helped, then I wanted to go down that counselling journey. So um joined up on the level two at the local college, then three, and then I did level four, and I qualified in 2015. Um, from there, I went on to do a um, qualification in CBT, then I did some work with um, Stop SO, so working with sex offenders. Um, I also did um, a qualification in critical incident debriefing, and then I went on to do um, EMDR, and also I've got my supervision qualification as well. So I haven't rested much. <laughs> no, I was, going to, I, was just going to, I was just going to say you need to get out and do a bit more, really, isn't it? <laughs> What have you, yeah. you, you been up to with your time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, you know, it's it's a incredible career pro progression, and I think that one that shows real real dedication to the work, and of course, the people who you serve are ultimately the clients. And you said in that you did a a, a qualification in critical incident debriefing. Just tell us a little bit about a little bit more about yeah. that. Yeah, it was um, it was just some um, I, I was working because all the way through I've had my own private practice but at times I did do um, work as a, an employee and one of the um, companies that I worked for um, said would I be interested in doing this this qualification so yeah I went to um, I went to a place in York and I did my critical incident debriefing which is it's the Mitchell model that we learnt um, and from there I've gone on to, um, uh, to to put that into practice by going in places and helping when when things go wrong. <laughs> yes and, and I think that brings us nicely on to you know what actually is critical incident debriefing what are the circumstances that mm -hmm. would ask somebody to come in 
and to critically incident debrief um, people. What what would the process of that be? What would have happened? Okay, so something significant um, that happened, something that's uh, that's that's potentially um, traumatic for people. Um, so things like the Manchester bombing. Um, London Bridge stabbing, um, things that happen in prisons or incidents. It's basically where you've got a group of people um, that have been either witnessed or involved in something horrific that you wouldn't generally want to to, to be involved in. And the, the purpose is to go in there um, to give psychoeducation around um, how things can affect you, what to look out for and how best to um, deal with um, any symptoms and things like that to deal with. Um, So, yeah, usually you go in um, no earlier than 48 hours um, because they need at least 48 hours to be able to, you know, react and, you know, the normal processing um, so usually between 48 and 72 hours you get sent in um, to to help with the people involved. And I guess at one at some point somebody's going to have to make a decision that a critical incident debrief is needed. So, you know, yeah. say, say we were to take um, an incident in an office where somebody was stabbed I'm, I'm sorry if this is triggering for people but you know this is the reality of, of the work that you do isn't it yeah and, yeah, and yeah. lots of people witnessed that there was lots of confusion there was lots of uh, panic and mm-hmm. and obviously uh, you know a per- person was apprehended or maybe not apprehended sometimes that doesn't mm-hmm. happen and yeah, the yeah. person was then taken for medical attention um you know, all the people around there would have suffered some form, or a lot would have may have suffered some form of trauma in different degrees witnessing that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Who, who would it be who actually picks the phone up and thinks we need to do something about this? It tends to be the managers of the place where it's happened or whoever's um, involved with looking after the staff that were involved or, and they usually pick up the phone and go to um, their EAP um, and ask the EAP if they've got anything that can help with that. And that's usually when people that have been qualified like myself will be get, will be approached and asked to go and, and help in that area. So an EAP is the Employment Assistance Programme, perhaps best known for, you know, if someone's having a difficulty personally, they would go to the, the Human Resources Department or maybe refer to the Human Resources Department. Someone says, you're going through a really difficult time. And as an organisation, yeah. we want to support you. And they would be referred to an EAP and the EAP would pick that up then, may offer counselling or appropriate interventions um, yeah. for for a certain length of time. So it would be a, a human resources or a managerial function. Yeah. Now, yeah. when we come to, and I know you can't speak about specifics of the groups mm-hmm. that you have um, facilitated, but as mm-hmm. a general observation, you know, are there, are there different dynamics that play out in groups? I mean, some groups, I guess, are going to be traumatised, but is there a case sometimes where groups... Um, are a little bit kind of um, embattled where members of the group maybe blame another member of the group or or the organisation. And how do you work with that? Okay, so um, the first thing you do when you go in is you get a list of of the names of the people that were involved and you'd split it into three groups. So you'd have the, the people that were actually witnessed and were you know actually saw um what happened and then the second group would be the people that were like your your first responders the people that came in after the event had happened and then the third group would be the people that have um that have um been affected maybe knew somebody knew the person that was as you said, stabbed or, or whatever. So then you you deal with them and you'd keep them separate wherever possible. Um, so so as not to uh, you know cause the re uh, well traumatization because um, if somebody hasn't witnessed it, 
and then they start hearing all all the details then that can that can cause issues but yeah you you, you know i have been to them before where um some the fight flights kicked in and you've got two first aiders who you would hope would be responding to that that as you said stabbing but one of them their fight flights kicked in and it was i'm running in the opposite direction and another one that goes straight into it and then it can end up with a bit of conflict um between the two Um, But that's where the psychoeducation comes in because um, explaining to them how we respond to um, trauma and how the fight, flight, freeze, flop, we don't have a choice. Um, So you might have somebody who is in the middle of a, a, a fight and the big burly bouncer kind of bloke runs in the opposite direction and somebody else who maybe you would think would run but didn't so it's you don't have a choice and it's making them aware of that and I think that helps them to support and open up the conversation between the people that are maybe in conflict yes and I think that I think that brings up an interesting point, doesn't it? As a general observation, we we expect people like the first responders and fire service personnel and the police and, you know, uniform services, shall we say, to mm-hmm. to almost, you know, we, we don't say it explicitly, but sometimes we, we ask them to be almost immune to the yes. natural human tendency. Of, yeah. of fear. And, it, it, and I, you know, speaking speaking for myself, I think it doesn't matter how well, trained you are everybody has a as a trigger point once that limbic system of the brain kicks in yeah. um that's it you you know yeah. you, you're not going to slip it out of gear until it decides to do it itself <laughs> yeah yeah massively massively and i think you know having the, the the part of the um the conversation that we have with the people is you know we start off with the um psychoeducation type of things that they might expect that they would feel um, or not feel there's no right or wrong but mainly it's you know that it's it's a normal reaction to an abnormal situation mm. and to take the pressure the pressure off and that's really important because i think people then i forget they, they feel like they you know they can relax a little bit because it's it's normal but mm. it's not a normal situation yeah, abs- absolutely. It's it's it, you, you, you're absolutely right. It's an abnormal it's an abnormal situation, and people can go through training and drills, and but until it actually happens, as my my father said, who was a military man, no plan survives contact with the enemy. And I'm not saying that the people are traumatized at the enemy, but the, the idea I'm trying to get across is is you can train and plan and strategize, but when it actually happens. You know, you are mm-hmm. in the hands of, of individuals whose psychology and and automotive nervous system kicks in, and you mm-hmm. you, you don't know. Um, you know, you can't really you can't really plan for that. You can't train people with real stabbings. You know, no. <laughs> real bomb explosions. You you no. can simulate it. So yeah. so it's part of that. So is there any part of of the work? where you may be in part of a legal process. You know, you talked about London bombing, you talked about stabbings. It is a part of that where you you may be brought to maybe a coroner's court or, or have to make a report to anybody? That's always a, um, <laughs> always a, a possibility, but uh, touch wood, I haven't as yet. Um, and um, to be fair, we we don't report back, and that's one of the things that we we say to people. You know, what happens in the room stays in the room. Normal confidentiality applies, obviously, um, but nothing's going to be going back to managers around. You know, these have been saying this or doing this, or they're angry with you for this or whatever. So it it is normal. You, you have to put your normal confidentiality in, but it is a, it is making it that um, them feel comfortable enough to be able to talk if they want to, but there's no pressure for them to do so. So they can see you, you know, we always 
have at the end of the um, at the end of the the debrief is you have a room on your own so that people can come and find you one by one if they felt that they couldn't talk mm. while they were there and making sure that they've got the support afterwards quite often um, you'll do the initial critical instant debrief and then go back in again um, like the following week as um you know with a room of being one to one so as people can come a bit of a drop in so that people can come and and help you know and get the help if they need it sure um is, is there any cases where you may see someone who's gone through the critical instant debrief process and realize that they need may need some extra support maybe need some yeah. therapy yeah what, yeah what's the process there um, usually, um, depending on on how the referrals come through, but usually it would be advising them to get in touch with um, their EAP. You know, if if that's where it's come through, or their manager, asking them to contact their manager, their or the GP if they're wanting to keep it external and ask the GP for for further you know further support. Yeah, absolutely, and. Um- I guess my I guess my final question is, what does it demand of you, the, the the person who's facilitating it? How do you take care of yourself when you're in the process of all these people who some of them may be traumatised? What 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 do you put in place to take care of you? <laughs> Probably dissociation. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it is, it's hard, you know, and, and I think for me, I am very good at um, putting that those routines in place. You know, I'm going in, I'm putting this shield on, I'm going in as a therapist, I'm going in to do a job. And then I have the, um, do the process because you've got to think on your feet. You really have got to think on your feet when you're doing it. Um, because like you said you do get you can have conflicts of people why didn't you do that why did you do that so you've got to be able to navigate that as well so be confident in what you're doing and then at the end of it um i have a critical instant debrief so with with another therapist so i'll debrief the debrief if that makes sense and i'll go through what i've found how it affected me what i'm left with if there's anything that's that's concerning, because quite often after an, a, a critical incident debrief, especially if it's a company that's been involved and it's work colleagues, it can sometimes make the team quite fragmented. So it's about negotiating that and making sure that I've got rid of all that at the end of it and I can walk away from it. So I usually have a debrief within... 24 hours of, of leaving site. Sometimes the debriefs can go on for days. So it's just making sure that you've got that support in between, you know, somebody you can you can talk to. And who would that debrief be with? Would that be someone who's trained or would that be through supervision or a mixture? How would that work? Mixture. It's um, other people that are qualified in critical incident debriefing. So they get, the, get what it is that you've gone into supervision through supervision i'll also do it through there and just also talking to other therapists about if there's anything left like i said i'm i'm quite good at being able to to do that and um and not carry it but yeah it, you can't walk away from it and think it's not going to affect you because it does it does you've got to be you have got to be quite robust to do it but you know the the how I feel afterwards. It feels great that I've helped. I've helped people. I've helped them through that. And I guess that really takes it back full circle to when we first started. When you know you, you wanted to help people, you know, yeah. because of your own, um, you know, th- through your own therapy, you, you identified you wanted to help people, and and you are Karen. Definitely, yeah, you are. It's been a fascinating insight into an area maybe of therapy that isn't very well known, but I think no. is, is a growing edge and also is in is in demand. We live, unfortunately, in a very, very difficult world at the moment and it doesn't look like it's going to get any better quickly. No. And I, regretfully, I think there'll be a lot more 
of of the work that you've been doing you know be doing a lot more of it so karen moore thank you so much for joining us massive thank you to karen moore thank you to you rory for reaching out bringing us the guests who bring the good stuff that's my new uh, catchphrase that is <laughs> really, very good Ken. It's, very good. it's all in the tone of the voice the good the stuff. good stuff <laughs> <laughs> you joined us for the Counselling Tutor Podcast. This has been episode 282. Yes, we started off with student services and choosing academic text. How not to get bogged down and, quite frankly, bankrupted than buying books. We moved on then to ethical, sustainable practice with a focus on ethical counselling from home, benefits and drawbacks. And we went into a deep dive on the practicalities of working from your own home and then we finished with practice matters matters we interviewed karen i interviewed karen moore on critical incident debriefing and before we close out today's episodes i've got a quick favor to ask you the listener first if you've enjoyed and benefited from ken and myself's conversation today please leave us a five-star review on whichever platform you're tuning in from it generally helps us reach more ears and grow our community and secondly, if someone in your circle might benefit from um, the episode, why don't you share it on your social media platform? Word of mouth is so powerful, and we appreciate every share, tweet, or X, as it is now, or post that brings new listeners into our community. Thank you for being such a vital part of your journey. Thank you for letting us into your journey. And as always, stay grounded and stay safe. Take the stress out of your counselling studies and get the support of Rory and I by joining us in the Counselling Study Resource. See how Counselling Study Resource can help you. Visit counsellingtutor.com. That's counsellingtutor.com. Thank you for listening to the Counselling Tutor podcast. Find the show notes for this episode by visiting counsellingtutor.com.